What a beautiful thought, Father. That we will stare into the face of your Son forever. What a what a, a happy <coughs> thought. What a joyous thought. A thought that would take our hearts out of the the different <coughs> sufferings and trials that they may be in and just take us upward. Father, indeed, I am thankful, Lord, to be before your people. It is a trembling thing, a joyous thing, sobering thing, Lord, thinking about what heard Jeremy say about feeding the sheep, and what I do pray indeed that you would be with me as I as I desire to do exactly what you told Peter to do, to feed your sheep. Father, help. May we look at Christ and be greatly encouraged, and may the lost see their need and run. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Matthew 4, 24. Be our foundational passage. <clears throat> Matthew four twenty four says, So his so wait for the pages to stop. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. I think it was about three weeks or so ago where Jeremy focused your attention on Christ as being fully God. That was about three weeks ago. I was listening to that message and my mind began to go back to different accounts in Scripture. I mean, again, thinking about Christ as God, you start thinking about God. And I began to think about these different accounts as I was preparing to preach for you. So I think about times when, when both the character in the scripture and we ourselves were confronted with the holiness of God, the power of God, the fear of God in these different accounts. I mean, you, you think about Adam, right? You remember Adam and he and Eve, they sinned. They're in the garden. They hear the Lord coming. What do they do? They hide themselves from the Lord. Why? Because they knew they were naked, they knew that they were dirty, they knew that they were guilty, and here comes the holy, holy, holy one, and they hid themselves. And we see these pictures of the Lord, we read it this morning, looking out on humanity, at all the wickedness, the evil intention of the heart was only evil continually. And that doesn't even talk about what they were doing with their actual bodies, just the thoughts, just the intention was wicked. And the Lord looks at all of this and he is angry and he's furious and he's grieved to his heart that he created mankind. And so what does he do? He sends his, his flood upon humanity and wipes out everyone, everything except for Noah and his family and the animals. Again, getting these pictures of the Lord, this holy God. Then we see him pouring his fury upon Sodom and Gomorrah for their depravity, for their perversions. He rained down fire and brimstone upon them. In San Antonio, this past week, almost really this, in, in the end of May, it's been raining ridiculous amounts of water. And it's funny because rain, is, it's water. Water isn't scary. Water isn't dangerous. You get wet. We do it all the time. We take showers. Yet when it rains, people flee for cover and shelter from water. If you think about fire and brimstone falling from heaven, what a thought. What a, 
What a thing, and it's coming from the Lord himself. And again, what, what is this picture showing us? It's showing us that there is this holy, holy, holy God and these wicked people. There's this distinction, this separation that is repeatedly being brought to us. This awesome majesty of the divine king. We see it. And you have to think that the people in the Old Testament, they're taking notice as they're seeing these things played out. It's being revealed to them, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of humanity. And it's being passed down from their children to their children's children as we read it ourselves in the scripture. And for me, perhaps one of the most striking things when I think about who God is, um, is when we see the interaction of God and man. I mean, I think that's one of the most telling uh, evidences of the, the separation, of the distinction, right? That we see man and God coming into contact and we see what that looks like. It's an extremely revealing thing. So as we're holding our place in Matthew, I want to show you a couple of things before we come back here. So if you could turn to Exodus chapter 19, verse 10, we're going to look at some of these examples of God and man and interaction. And I pray that you'll see this theme. That's what I'm hoping to prove to you here, that there's a theme that we're going to see to some degree. So Exodus 19, verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Think of all this that we just see here right now. The Lord is going to come down upon the mountain. I mean, not, not even in the midst of the people, but on the mountain. And they're not to touch the mountain. They can't get too close to the mountain. They have to be at a certain distance. And that's the place of safety. And in order to do this, what do they have to do? They have to have two days of consecration. They have to wash their garments. And if you look at verse 15, look, look at what Moses tells them. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. This doesn't mean that you couldn't stand next to your sister. But it meant for husbands, do not take your marital privileges for this time. Something similar to what we see in right, 1 Corinthians 7 where it talks about there's a certain period of time where a husband and wife should refrain from one another to give themselves to prayer, right? Um, similar thing, the idea that they had to get themselves ready to approach a distance of a mountain where the presence and glory of God would descend. And they were told very seriously, very sternly, keep your distance. This was a serious matter. They were basically told, don't come too close or what's going to happen? You will die. You will be killed. And look what happens when the Lord does come down. Look at verse uh, 21 through 25. Um, in the same place. 19. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the to the Lord. To look and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them 
And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Think of all this. The Lord is going to come down on the mountain and he's telling them again, don't let them get too close. Don't let them break through. Don't let them look upon me or I'm going to break out against them. Tell the priests, stay back. They cannot come close. It's not safe. Stay back. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 40. <clears throat> Verse 34. So the Lord had given clear instruction to Moses exactly how the tabernacle was to be built um, what colors would it be used? Who was to do what? What fabrics? What uh, woods? What um, metals? Who was to do what? How they had to do it in order for the tabernacle to be erected. And they set it up. All right. They finally get it the way it's supposed to be done. And if you look at verse 33, it says, and he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Now, here is the culmination. Here's the payoff. This is what they have been wanting. They did all this so that what the Lord would meet with them. And look at what happens when he does. Verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, what do we find out when the Lord fills the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle? What a thing. Because the Lord was near, the people were unable to come close. Do you see that? The Lord descended upon the mountain. The mountain was off limits. They had to stay back. The Lord fills the tabernacle, Moses couldn't draw near. He was kept at a distance. In Eden, the Lord came close, Adam hid himself. Again, this distance, this separation. Then you think of all throughout the Old Testament, all the different offerings that were commanded in the law for them to offer. They had the sin offering, the guilt offering, grain offering, peace offering. These were very detailed instructions given to offer different sacrifices for what? I mean, and, and it was detailed which animals could be given. They had to even look a certain way. If they have spot, if they have a blemish, can't use that one. You know, this one has to have a certain um, cloven hoof and it needs to be cloven and parted. You know, very detailed for what purpose? In order to draw near to the Lord, to gain access to him, to find forgiveness in him. And this was only to be done by certain people. Anybody couldn't just do this. You couldn't just wake up in the morning and say, okay, I want to, no, 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 no. You bring your sheep, you bring your ox, you bring your, your turtle dove, you bring your grain, we'll be the one to offer it. This was only a certain tribe from a certain lineage, the sons of Aaron. You think of the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, that can only be approached by one man. I mean, you look at the interaction with the Ark of the Covenant, it was a frightening thing. I mean, you remember when they were bringing the Ark back and Uzzah put his hand to it, right, to steady the oxen? They weren't carrying it the right way, and what happened? The Lord struck Uzzah dead, and it said that David was afraid. He was upset. He said, well, how are we going to have, if this is what happens, What's going to happen to us? And they say, man, we're going to put this ark in the house of Obed-Edom. <laughs> we're not bringing this thing to us. The Lord is frightening. We get close to him, people die. They had the Day of Atonement, the one day of year when the high priest could enter into the tabernacle or in the days of Solomon, in the days of the temple, uh, through the temple, through the court, and they would go through the Holy of Holies, and only after many ceremonial cleansings and washings and consecrating and things had to be done just right in order to be able to go through that Holy of Holies, through that thick curtain, and there's the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of the Lord would be. One time a year, one person, in order to do what? To approach Him. 
This is all about approaching Christ. I mean, you have the bulletin there. What were you talking about? The beauties of Christ. He's approachable. We see this trend in the Old Testament. There's a theme. God is big. He's holy. He's majestic and glorious. Humans, we are small, sinful. Sinful, we're not to get too close to him lest we die. You can't just walk up on the Lord. You might actually die. He's dangerous. You can't just approach the mountain. You can't just approach the ark. You can't just approach the tent of meeting, the holy places. Remove your shoes. You can't just walk up on him. He is great and mighty and grand. You know, if you read Job, one of the things he wanted, he wanted to meet with the Lord. If you listen, Job 23, verse 3 and 4, um, if you want to turn there, you can. Job requests something. <laughs> he, he, wanted his, he wanted his time with the Lord. Listen, listen to how he puts this in Job 23, verse 3 and 4. Remember, he's, he's surrounded by these, these unwise counselors, except for Elihu. They're bringing all these charges against him. Maybe that's where the prosperity gospel found its origins, that the only time you're suffering is when you've done something wrong, but God always blesses those who are doing what's right. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. This is Job talking about God. Oh, that I would find him, that I might come even to his seat. I want to approach God and I want to lay my case before him. I have some arguments. I have some, you know, not like you want to argue with God, but I have some points that I think need to be brought to him. The Lord answered his prayer. When the Lord did approach him, when he did stand before the seat of the Lord, his words were very different. See, there was a there was a distance and he was talking one way. When the Lord came near, his speech changed completely. If you look at Job 42, here's where Job, after the Lord has leveled him with question after question that he could not answer. After the Lord gave him the answer of his prayer and came close to him. Here's what Job had to say. Then, Job 42, 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye, what? Sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Once again, getting close to the Lord resulted in fear, despising oneself because of sin, being staggered by the holiness of God. He's terrifying in the office back there there is this poster on the wall it's one of my favorite pictures I actually want to find out where you got it from because I want to get one and it's a picture of the martyrs in the middle of the Colosseum and coming out of the pit it's a well already standing on the sand is a lion and then there's I think a leopard coming out you think about staring in the face of a full-grown male lion looking into the eyes of a lion and you you know like I know that would be a terrifying thing but think how much more terrifying it would be to stare in the face of the God that made that lion be more paralyzing famous passage that brings this home as well, is Isaiah 6, right? Let's, let's look at it again. We don't want familiar, familiar, we don't want things that have become familiar to us to breed contempt, that because we are familiar with it, that it will somehow lose its awe in, in, in intriguing us to be amazed by what we're seeing. 
course, if you've been a Christian for any amount of a time, I'm certain that you have read this passage again and again. But let's look at it again and be amazed by what we see. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This brother was traumatized by this. I could scream as loud as I want to. All of us collectively, we could raise our voices to the highest decibel and the, the blinds wouldn't even move. The voice of the Lord caused the very foundation of the temple to shake and tremble. Angels, seraphim, that would cause us to shriek in terror that if we saw them or if we heard their voices, if we're just here and we're meeting, we're singing hymns and suddenly we hear this booming, bellowing voice, holy, 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 we would be silenced. Some of us might cower under the, the seats. We would be terrified. And this is the God in whom these creatures dwell in the immediate presence, covering their face. They're not being commanded to say this. This is the natural response that comes from being in the presence of the holy, holy, holy God. And Isaiah gets a, a glimpse. He gets a vision of the Lord. And he curses himself. We see Adam and Eve hiding themselves. We see Moses being commanded, tell the people, don't get too close to that mountain. You stay back. If they come, if they touch that mountain, they will be stoned. Don't even touch them. Stone them. Even if an animal, if a bird comes near, if a goat wanders too close, stone that thing too. When the Lord does descend upon the tabernacle, Moses can't even enter. The Lord is there. We see this pattern, the Ark of the Covenant. Can't get close to it. You touch it, you'll die. And here, Isaiah, Job, again and again and again, we see this theme. He's powerful. And again, what did Jeremy do? He pointed your attention to the fact that Christ is indeed fully God and fully man. And everything about God would make us want to cower, right? If the glory of the Lord came upon this place, it's not going to be like these false churches that say, oh, the Spirit of God is here, and they put glitter in the air conditioning vents and gold dust comes down, and people are falling back and running around and laughing and clucking like a chicken, saying the Spirit of God is here. That's false. The Spirit of God comes upon a place, and what happens? You can't even enter the place. You get too close, people die. But with all of that truth, Listen again. Go there. Matthew, as we started with, 4.24. And I, I just think this is amazing. <laughs> I just think this is completely amazing. <clears throat> and he went through out all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, 
those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them, and great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Do you see the stark contrast? Side by side, this is amazing. Notice, these people, who are these people? Sick, demon-possessed, the paralyzed, the epileptics, those who had all these manner of problems. And then it's not just those people who are coming close to Christ, but the people who are bringing them, right? So you have a demon-possessed child. You're bringing this demon-possessed child to Christ, but you, the parent, are coming as well. You have this person who's paralyzed in a bed, and we saw this in other places in the gospel. His friends are carrying him on a bed or, or bringing him down through the roof. People are drawing near to Jesus. And it says that his fame spread and the crowds were following him. And everywhere he would go, crowds would follow him. They would come near. What were they doing? They were constantly talking to him, touching him, looking at him constantly. They drew near to him. They got close to him. He touched them. They touched him. I think one of the most um, vivid examples of what I'm saying right here about the closeness that they had is found in Luke 8. And if you can listen to this, um, this is the account of the woman who had the issue of blood, right? As, and uh, let me read this to you. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. For I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. People were pressing all around him. You think of the crowd, right? Sometimes, some of you may have been to a, a Black Friday sale. And there's people all around and you're right at the door. And what happens? Everyone's trying to push and trying to get in. You think of this. Tell me this. What is more <coughs> holy, the Ark of the Covenant or the Son of God? They couldn't touch the Ark of the Covenant, but everybody is pressing in and touching the Son of God. That's amazing to me. They didn't ask permission there was no washing of garments. There was no two days of consecration. None of that. There was, no, there was no more limits set around him. Well, okay, you can come only this close, but if you touch the hem of my garment, stone him. None of that. No more limits. No more come this close, no closer, lest you die. Not at all. He went around the people, teaching, preaching, healing, laying his hands upon the weak, the sick, the outcast, brothers and sisters, it says his fame spread. People began to approach him and follow him. You know, we see in the Old Testament, like it's not like everybody who came into contact with God was terrified in their eyes. It wasn't that. We see the Lord approaching Abraham with the two angels, remember? And they went off to Sodom to go rescue Lot. Abraham is having a normal conversation. But what was that? That was the Lord approaching him. We see Jacob wrestling with God. What is that? Again, that's the Lord approaching him. We see Samson's parents, and there's his mother, and here's the Lord. Again, approaching them. It's a very different situation. I mean, we live in a day where you can't even approach somebody who sings well without getting through security. All you do is sing. Big deal. And you got security and you need to get an, like, an appointment to try to get in touch with this person. We're talking about the son of God here. Anyone could just walk right up 
on Christ and touch him and talk to him and look in his face. What was Moses told? You cannot look at my face. Yeah, I'm going to do a cleft of the rock and hide you in there where we get our song, right? Rock of edges, uh, rock of ages, cleft from me. Let me hide myself in thee. That's the idea of I'm being hidden in this rock as the Lord is coming by. But people looked right in the face of the living God. Amazing. Our brother, he, he explained to us well that Christ is God. But let me, let, let me uh, uh, echo some of the things that he already expressed to you. Turn to John 8, 54. This famous passage. I love this passage. You know... This, this is one of those, you know, nowadays people drop mics. This is one of those mic dropping moments that Jesus made. John eight fifty four. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, Jesus had some strong things to say to people. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them. You can just hear the hush. Right. In the in the movie, uh, the Gospel of John, how it's like a word for word um, rendering of the Gospel of John in the film. It's amazing. Like they have this music and it's like and everyone's looking at him. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> so they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Christ let all the people know exactly who he is, the great I am. Moses stands before the angel of the Lord who's in the bush that's burning. And he says, who shall I say sent me? Tell them, I am has sent you. I am who I am. What is Christ telling us? The, I am the same I am that spoke to Moses, the same I am that destroyed the Egyptians, the same great I, great I am that brought the Israelites through the wilderness, the same great I am who descended upon the mountain that said, you cannot come close lest you die. The same I am that filled the temple with his glory. The same I am that Isaiah looked up and cursed himself for seeing the king. What a thing. Christ is that same God who was once so unapproachable, so terrifying to get near. The same living God who required so much cleansing. This wasn't their own idea. They were told, Consecrate yourself, cleanse yourself, watch yourself, do not go near a woman. This was the commandment. And now, you're able to just walk up on the, the living God, look in the face of the living God, touch the living God, and not be put to death. And if you're not yet floored, turn to Colossians 1. <clears throat> Colossians 1 verse 15 and we're going to read through verse 20 Colossians 1 15 he is the image of the invisible God first off wow <laughs> what a statement he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now notice this, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The fullness of God is pleased to dwell in Jesus the Christ. Now, as a former Muslim, you, you, you got to realize that hits me like a ton of bricks. It is glorious. Do you remember what Solomon said after the temple was built? He said, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built? The highest heavens cannot contain Children, where is God? Everywhere. everywhere. He's everywhere. How can you contain the God who's everywhere? You think of the vastness of space. And as technology improves, they're showing us that it's farther and deeper and wider than we ever thought. They're showing you stars and planets and suns and distant moons and it's big and big and big and all of that. Is just space. You think of the highest heavens, the very city of God cannot contain him. All of that multiplied a billion times and it still cannot contain him. Yet, <laughs> what does the scripture say that we just read? Read the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. That's amazing. The highest heavens can't contain him. Heaven can't contain him. The city of God can't contain him. Earth can't contain him. But the fullness of the deity, the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ on earth. All power all might, sovereign authority, blinding holiness, the majestic glory within him fully. And in spite of all of that reality, what we see in the Old Testament, this, this terrifying reality, stay back. The reality that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him, we see an approachability with Christ that is truly Beautiful. I mean, isn't that what this series is? The beauties of Christ. So we're going to look at some examples in our remaining time of how we see this played out. So Matthew chapter 8. We'll spend most of our time in Matthew, and I think we got a couple in Luke. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to look at some people who approached him. <clears throat> Eight verse one, when he came down from the mountain, last time we looked at a mountain, it was untouchable. He came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him and behold, it's like the, it's like the, the writers of scriptures are like, okay, everything is going normal and now get ready for the shock of the century. Behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. Now, you got that in your mind? Listen to this. This is from Numbers 5, 1 through 3. This is the law. Listen to this. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has a discharge and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. You get that? Put them out. They're leprous, put them out. They have a discharge, put them out. Did they touch a dead relative? Put them out. Why? Because I'm there. And if you let them stay, they will defile the whole camp. 
And what do we just read in Matthew 8, 1? A leper. Behold, a leper. He's not even supposed to be here. He's supposed to be outside the camp. Hey, Jesus coming down off that mountain. That leper must have heard something that Christ said and said, he's approachable and I can come near to him. And he came near. And what does Jesus do? What does the fullness of God in bodily form do? He puts out his hand and touches him. A leper? A leper has discharges. A leper has parts of their body that are literally dead. The smell, the foulness, the ugliness of it all, the contagiousness. You know, people talking about this Zika virus and all this stuff and, oh, keep it away. We don't want anyone who's contagious. Look, if you got a stomach bug, the church is like, yo, can you stay at home? Because we don't want to catch it. We got a leper, a leper, extremely contagious. A leper had to let you know they were a leper. If you got, no, unclean, unclean, stay away. And what does Jesus do? He sees this leper who approached him. He puts out his hand and touches him. He was not rebuked for this. Christ didn't tell him that he has now made him unclean by coming so near. He's not told that you just defiled this whole place. What are you doing here? Don't you see this crowd? He felt safe to approach him. He felt like this was allowed. This was going to be okay. This was something that could be done. You don't get more of an outcast than a leper. Now that was physical, right? Physical filth, physical sickness, physical isolation. Brethren, Christ is welcoming you to him. Though you might be an outcast of this world, to your family, maybe your issues are so gross, so disgusting, and no one wants to be around you. Perhaps you can relate to this leper. I pray you would look at this account, look at Jesus, and see you can approach him as well, just as the leper did. The leper did not need to take away his leprosy in order to approach Christ. If you are a child of God, you have full access to him. And if you're lost, notice the picture. The leper was unclean, wicked, dirty, filthy, told to be outside of the camp, and yet he could approach Christ. He was not hit with a lightning bolt. He was not told to be stoned to death for coming too close. No, though the fullness of God dwells in Christ, he is fully God. He is the light and life of man. All that is completely true. The leper was still able to approach. So, so are you. (laughs) You too can come close and approach him. What about this? Have you ever considered that even the enemies of our Lord approached him often? Think of how often the enemies of the Lord came to him. I mean, I begin to think about that. You know, the proverb says that the wise man even makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. What kind of love was in him that even his enemies felt safe to approach him, that when they looked at him, they still felt like they could walk up on him? Think of how often these words have been heard. As you've read the Gospels, undoubtedly you've heard it preached. Think of how often you've heard these phrases. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. Some Pharisees came and tested him. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem. And again, it goes on and on and on again. We see the same terminology. They came to him. They came to him over and over and over again. They approached him. Even Moses couldn't get in the tent. (laughs) Even Isaiah cursed himself before the presence of the Lord of hosts. Even Job despised himself before the Lord. These were all righteous men. These were holy and chosen and loved by the Lord. They were faithful to death, every one of them. How much more the enemies of God, if the faithful were afraid to come near to him, what should we see from the evil? But these enemies of our Lord came to him often, walked right up on him. They were not destroyed as Sodom was. They did not have two she bears come out of the forest and kill 42 of them for mocking the man of God. Right. This is what happened with uh, was that Elijah or Shah? Shah, right? Yeah. 
fire from heaven did not consume them. We know from the scripture that Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and Paul were all members of this group that we would call the, the villains of the New Testament. I mean, if you want to look for the bad guys of the New Testament, it's the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes. But from that number, we get Nicodemus, we get Joseph of Arimathea, and we get Paul, who used to be Saul. Imagine if the Lord said, no, you cannot come near to me. You are my enemy. Nicod think about Nicodemus. When did Nicodemus come to Christ? At night. And wh why, do why do we think he did that? Right. He was afraid of who? The people. That blows my mind. <laughs> the one in whom all fear is owed. The one to whom he should have been afraid of, he wasn't. He was afraid of people. He was afraid of them, so he came to Christ at night. Christ is the one that he should have been cowering before, trembling before, saying, oh no, I cannot come to him. But he felt comfortable enough to come to Christ. That's an amazing thing. What does that say about Christ? What kind, of, what kind of atmosphere was he presenting that made people feel so comfortable to say, you can approach me. I'm accessible. You can walk up on me. Even though you've been with those people who've been mocking me, you can still come. You can still come. Jesus made himself so meek, so humble, so low, that anyone could come to him. We sing it. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Thank you, Jesus, thank you. All those of us in this room who are <laughs> recipients of this grace, that are vessels of mercy, how do we come to this table? He came to us. He welcomed us to come, eat, sit, make peace with him. Are you an enemy of Christ? Maybe you're still in your sins and you're an enemy and you feel like, well, I've been hearing a lot about this wrath of God. I don't know about approaching him. Look, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they were able to come. And Jesus didn't tell them, don't come to me anymore. They made a decision. You know, there was a point where no one questioned him anymore because of the wisdom that kept coming out of his mouth. From that day forward, no one asked him any more questions. They made the decision on their own, but he never told them, don't come. He never forbade anyone, don't come. He was approachable. But more so, church, <laughs> you are not an enemy of Christ. And sometimes what happens? You sin, right? And you feel like, well, I can't approach him now. I submit to you that if the Pharisees could approach him, then you must come. If the enemies of our Lord could find pardon in his presence, then what keeps you, child of God? The very one he shed his blood for. The very one he suffered the wrath of God for. Is he going to give you such mercy and forgiveness and grace while you were yet sinners? Christ died for you. But now that you messed up, he's like, nah, 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 you can't come. You, did, you sinned last night. You think you can come to me now? He welcomed you while you were yet sinners. How much more now that you're a recipient of his grace and mercy are you welcome? You're adopted into the family of God, and will you say, no, I cannot come? I must not approach him if I am dirty. <laughs> that would be an insult. There he is on the cross, pierced for us. Our transgressions, the chastisement that brought him peace was laid, brought us peace was laid upon him. He did all this for us. There, the wrath of God being, he's drenched in the wrath of God. He's soaking wet in the wrath of God for us. Is he going to tell you to stay away now because you sinned, because you need him? No. He is approachable. 
It will be an insult to him to act in such a way. Come to him now and come quickly. Well, Matthew 17, 14. And when they came... Uh, and when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic uh, and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Something I noticed about this account is that it just says, a man. No names, just a man in need. I think that's comforting. This wasn't a Nicodemus. <laughs> this was not a Bartimaeus. This was not a Zacchaeus. This was just a man, just a simple man who had a child, we don't know his name either, who suffered terribly. And he was able to come. Christ was welcoming to the regular, everyday man who had a suffering child. You know, <coughs> brethren, sometimes you might feel like I'm small. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm not a missionary. I, I haven't traveled to this country and seen these great acts of God. I'm just a regular Christian. I'm just a housewife. I'm a, just a single mother. I'm a teenager. I'm just a young child. I can't even drive yet. You feel so insignificant because you're just a regular Christian. So small, so weak. You feel, you feel unimportant. Well, I shouldn't bother the master. That, that's for pastors. You know, of course, pastors should be able to go to him, but my, my needs cannot seriously be that important. These people are going to Muslim countries. The Lord wants to hear from them. This person is laboring 20 hours in the Word. Surely the Lord wants to hear from them. What do I do? I change diapers and I wash dishes. What do I do? I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to play with my little brother and my little sister in a way that honors God. What Big deal. I, I need help with that because I'm being tempted to be angry with my little brother or little sister. The Lord doesn't care about that. He's not interested, you might tell yourself, with my desires or with my tears or with my pleadings. Peter could approach Christ. That's Peter. But what do we see here? We see this man, this nameless man and his nameless child coming to our Lord, welcome to come, not hindered, not rebuked, but we see Christ able to be approached. Though this man had no name worthy of mentioning, this child had no name worthy of writing down. They still had access. Brethren, you too have access. Even if you feel small, that's okay. He came for the small. You feel weak, that's okay. He came for the weak. Approach the throne. Speaking of children, Matthew 19, 13. One of my fav favorite passages of Scripture as a parent. I'm sure many of you love this, or if you have a heart for children at all. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid hands on them and went away. Luke's account said even infants were being brought to him. And he was laying his hands on them. Do you see that? Remember, everything that we saw in the Old Testament is still true. 
God is still that holy. He is still that magnificent. He is still that majestic. He's still that terrifying. And what we saw in Colossians is still true, that all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. And so here you have this, this man, fully man, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and you have even children being brought to him. What does that say about his approachability? The same great I am that spoke and the universe leaped, leapt into existence. This God who created everything by the words of his lips, he was able to be approached even by little children. And if you know something about children, it doesn't take much to frighten children. Uh, I was thinking about <laughs> my, my little daughter, Faith, who there was a balled up piece of string and she thought it was like a spider or something and she was terrified. Just yesterday, my wife was telling me that my son Azariah is afraid of the vacuum cleaner and the lawnmower. But then she said, but you, you, you don't know. He is more afraid of the fan. We have this stand-up white fan, and she said, he is terrified of that thing. She said, watch, go see. So being parents, this is the kind of thing we do. So I take him out there and turn on the fan, and he starts to claw me and scream, and he's like, get it away, get it away. I'm like, it's safe, it's okay. And uh, He's doing all that kind of thing. A fan. <laughs> Children are terrified of fans and thread and vacuum cleaners. How much more would they be afraid of the thick cloud, of the thunderings, of the voice of many waters? The, the same God in whom the angels fear is saying, let the children come to me. And we don't see them running away in terror. We don't see them hiding their face and cowering and saying, mommy, no, no, not him. He said that he laid his hands on them. And even infants, infants, they don't like strangers. You ever tried to give your infant to a stranger and they're like, eh, who's this person? That's grandma, I don't know them. Even infants felt safe. What does that say about our Lord? What does that say about him? He is approachable. Are there children among us? There are, I see you. Have you come to Christ? Are you in him? Well, you know what he said? Don't let anybody tell you to stay away. No matter how old you are. I don't care how young you are. You are welcome to come. Approach him. He is not frightening where you need to stay away. No, he says, come. Let the children come to me so that he might save you so that he might redeem you, so that he might cleanse you, so that he might wash you. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. He tells you the same thing he told the other children. All right, Luke 7. I'm going to go out of Matthew for a moment and then go to Luke. Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And all commentaries typically agree that this woman was a what? A prostitute, a woman of the city, an immoral woman. She had a reputation for her sexual sin. You know what that means? That even those who are in sexual sin can come to Christ. You can approach Him. This woman was known for it. Well known. Even the Pharisee knew. 
if he knew what kind of woman this was. She felt safe enough to go into a Pharisee's home. These are the same guys who brought the woman who was caught with the, uh, in adultery, didn't bring the guy, but brought that woman to stone her. These are these guys. But it was something about Christ that she felt like, I can go into this home and I'll be okay. I can kiss his feet. I can wash his feet. I can be touching him. This would be, this is just inappropriate. You don't do this kind of thing in this day, a woman like that. But Christ was so approachable that though this woman had that kind of reputation, was known for that kind of sin, did those kinds of shameful things, and everybody knew about it. You know, it's not like today where people do things in their room with their computer and they think nobody knows. You can hide it on your phone and you think nobody knows. And you can walk around and you can have a good reputation and people still think that you're this, you know, really righteous person, but actually you're this person who has this hidden sin like Achan or like Gehazi and you're hiding it. This woman's sin was known. Her sin was known by all. But I say this, whether your sin is known by all or your sin is hidden, you still can approach Christ and you can go to him for mercy and for salvation and for cleansing. He welcomes you to come, no matter what you've done. I don't know if we have any prostitutes in the room, but if you are, you can come. I don't know if we have any people who have done these things in their past life. You don't have to be that extreme, or you could be, but you can still come. If you committed rapes or molestations, you can come. If you've been the victim of these things, you can come. One of the most sad accounts I see in Scripture is what Amnon did to his sister Tamar. And this woman was violated. And her father, David, oh, righteous David, he did not handle that thing right. He shut her up in a tower. She lived the rest of her life that way. That's not the way that the Father, that's not the way that Christ, that's not the way that the Spirit deals with those who have been victims of this kind of atrocity. He doesn't put you away in a tower. He says, welcome, come, come close. Let me heal you. Let me cleanse you. Let me wash you. Let me show you the way. I will make you better. I will make you new. I will make you clean. This is what he does. You know, I grew up in Rhode Island, and uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of beaches there. And um, as a child, we would go swimming a lot. Um, but in a place like Rhode Island where it gets cold, the water is also cold. And usually we would wait for one brave soul to, to brave the waters. And they would go in, and what would we wait to hear? Come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> so it is. We have approached Christ. And we're telling you, come on in, the water is fine. It's safe here. It's welcoming here. His arms are ready. We, we, we sang it this morning. I will arise and come to Jesus. He will do what? Embrace in his arms. You might look at Christ and see the thick clouds, the lightnings, the flashings, the terrible whirlwind. But remember this woman was able to approach. Brethren, have you sinned? Is it like we sang this morning when Satan tempts you to despair and tells you of the guilt within? Does, he, does the devil tell you to stay away until you're worthy to come back? Look at Christ again and see the little children coming to him. See the Pharisees coming to him. Seeing even this woman with the issue of blood. She couldn't walk to him. What did she do? She crawled. You might say, I've sinned. I'm weak. I can't even walk to him. But you can crawl. You can approach him as you may, but approach him. Do you feel as though I messed up? 
Well, he came for those who messed up. Mercy is found in going to him. Love is found in going to him. Forgiveness and grace and help is all found in approaching Christ. Go to him again and again and again. What does the scripture say? Let us then with confidence. The King James says, boldness. Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, the scripture says of God that he dwells in what kind of light? Unapproachable Unapproachable light. We can approach the one who dwells in unapproachable light. You see Bartimaeus couldn't even see but he's calling out Lord where are you I don't even know where you are but I know you're near (laughs) that's good approach that way approach as you may but approach the water is fine come close you might even be played with demons we see those who are plagued with demons coming close the man who had the legion of demons He came close. Will you stay away when even the demon-possessed were welcome to come and find forgiveness and mercy and find life and light and salvation? When even when someone was filled with an army of devils could approach? Same thing, again, we see this message. With each person we see interacting with Christ, it's the same thing. They could go to him. They were welcome to come. And they weren't just welcome to just come and be around him and leave the same. No, they were welcome to come and have their sin dealt with. They were welcome to come to be cleansed, to be washed, to be forgiven, to be helped, to be healed. When you come to Christ, you don't just come holding on to your sin and leave with it. You don't want to be like the rich young ruler. I mean, there are other people who came to Christ and they left the same. And that's not what I'm calling you to this morning. I'm calling you to look at the beauties of Christ, that you can approach Him with your sin. You can approach Him with your guilt. You can approach Him with your shame. You can approach Him with your worry. You can approach Him with your fear. You can approach Him with... I mean, I think of our sister last night with that accident out there. We were approaching her, and you just heard the voice of despair. Those of you who were there, you heard it. She was weeping and wailing. You know, like I know. She could take all of that to him, and he could calm the situation. If he could calm the seas, he could calm the seas in your life. He's approachable. Think of the cross. Even on the cross, what do we see? There he is, right? He's suffering. People are mocking him. They're laughing at him. He's pierced hands feet, crown of thorns, back shredded, face unrecognizable, blood all over him, weary, oh, the Father's wrath is upon him. And what do we see? Right there on the cross, we see two thieves. And both of them were railing against him. They were right with the crowd mocking him. But then what? What happened to one of those thieves? He repented. He turned. He saw Christ. He sees Christ in all the things that are coming out of his mouth. I think it's the same thing that made the centurion beat his breast and say, this man was righteous. Surely this man was innocent. The way he died, the way he was there on the cross suffering, this thief on the cross who once mocked him, who railed against him, then when he approached him, he didn't find Christ angry with him. He didn't find Christ say, no, you had your chance. You mocked me. Even there on the cross while he's suffering the full weight of the wrath of God, when this man's mouth was just moments ago filled with cursings and mockery, in an instant he changed all thoughts of Christ and he found Christ telling him, this day you will be with me in paradise. That is our Christ. He is approachable. No matter what you've done, no matter what sin you're in, no matter what was just in your mouth, if you turn from that and turn to Him, you will find a Christ who will wash you and say, you will be with me in paradise.
Do not merely approach him as the rich young ruler did. Approach him in faith and repentance. Do not merely approach him as Judas did. Do not merely uh, approach him as Herod did, who was impressed with his, his, his tricks. Do not look into his beautiful face and then walk away as Pilate did. No, my friends, you must approach him in faith, trusting in all he has done, repenting of all you have done. You must approach the approachable one, resting in all of his work, repenting of all of yours. Look to him and be saved. Look away from your efforts and look and trust in his. Now here's the final word and I will be done. My wife pointed this out to me as I was expressing uh, what I was going to be talking about. She said, you know, one thing about Jesus you notice that he didn't stay too long in any place. He was always passing by. People had opportunities to approach him and then he would pass by. (coughs) So it is. On the day that you hear, harden not your heart. The message of salvation goes out to you today. Christ is offering you arms of embracing today, now, saying, come. Come and I will embrace you. But notice that he passes by. He's going on. He doesn't just set up camp. You know, Peter was like, oh, should we set up three tents for you? One for Elijah, one for Moses, one for you? No, no, no. Jesus is passing by. You do not know when he will pass by and not come that way again. Today he is offering you approach me. Today he is offering you mercy. Today he's offering you salvation. Today he's offering you forgiveness of sin. But the reality of the truth is this. You do not know when that will be the final time. And you don't want to stand before him on the final day and know he offered you an invitation. Just as he did with the invitation to the wedding feast. He offered the invitation and they said, oh no, not right now. I got some stuff to do. Notice, A second invitation was not given to those people. He offers now. Come now. He's approachable. Whether you're a Pharisee, whether you're sexually immoral, whether you're a little child, whether you feel you're nobody, you're insignificant, you're a woman, you're a man, you're old, you're young, to all people the same message is given. Approach Him now. Christ is approachable. And that's beautiful. (laughs) Fully God pleased to dwell, offers his hands to us. Come close. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, that no one here would wait to approach until it's too late. For there will be a time when all will approach the judgment seat. There will be a time when all will approach the great white throne And that time of approaching will be very different. Father, I pray that those who do not know you will approach now while your arms are open to embrace, while your words are comforting and encouraging to cleanse and heal and forgive and save. And Father, mostly I pray for my brethren, those who have sinned, those who are being lied to by the enemy, being told you have to clean yourself up before they can approach. They need to do these works before they can approach. They need to punish themselves before they can approach. Father, I pray that with all confidence and boldness that they would indeed approach the throne of grace to receive help in the time of need. Thank you, Lord, that you give us welcome. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.